And so, because I had that within me, and because I understood the politics, and I understood, you know, the race, I didn't understand it fully as a young person, but I had some idea, I had a glimpse enough to know some of the challenges that I would be met with in, in life. I, I, I was strengthened in that. And I was up for the challenge of taking on an environment that was the total opposite of what I was used to. I wanted to experience diversity. I wanted to experience something different. Because I, I realized also that in order to build the bridge and to give back to those in my community, I knew that I would have to interact with other folk because oftentimes you don't know the package your blessing is going to come in. And you know, sometimes our blessing comes from the unlikeliest of people. And so I had to realize that some of the people who held the key to the blessing and had the blessing, they weren't going to necessarily look like me on the outside. But I needed to learn the game too. But in order to learn the game, you got to be willing to play the game. And so I said, I'm going to play the game. So I, I applied the ground, got in, and I was excited because, for one, you know, my faith was strong. When I applied, sent that application off, I um, sent it off with a prayer. Because I believe faith for our work is dead. And that's what the word teaches me. And, you know, I had put forth the work. And then I said, Lord, I need you to do your thing. Hook a brother up. <laughs> Hook me up. Big time. Hook a brother up. And so I, I said, Lord, you got to do this. And I sent it off. And when I sent it off, it was a done deal. It was done. It was released into the atmosphere. And there was nothing that anyone could tell me to dissuade me from thinking the opposite of the fact that I was going to be accepted into Brown University. And let me tell you, my faith was so strong, I went to school because I dropped the application off on my way to the bus stop. And I went to school and I told her, I got into Brown. I got into Brown. I got into Brown. I got into Brown. Crazy faith. Crazy faith. So it was a proud day. I think it was November 22nd, 1990. Four. Yeah, I'm pretty old. 1994, I received the acceptance letter from Brown University. I, I not only was admitted, but I was admitted early action. I was excited. I was excited. I was like, yeah. 200, I was admitted into the 232nd class of Brown University. And you couldn't tell me. I was a star. I just knew it. And again, remember, this is me thinking at 16 and 17 years old. Remember that. I would be humbled over the years by life's challenges and experiences. Got into Brown and was excited, you know, about the road ahead. But, you know, I'm learning. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Because you're just my kid. <laughs> and I got what I asked for. I asked to be in a situation that was the total opposite of what I was used to, which came with its challenges. And I don't care how much you try to prepare for it before you get there. It's nothing like when you get there and you're in the middle of it. And you're like, Lord, save me. Rescue me. Help me. And I got there and I was challenged, you know, more from a social standpoint. I was definitely challenged academically, but from a social standpoint, you know, I, I, I isolated myself. Growing up in the apostolic church, we were definitely schooled on, the do, schooled on the do's and the don'ts. What to do, what not to do. So I had committed to my mom, I committed to God. I'm not going to do drugs, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to have premarital sex, and I'm not going to interact with anyone who does all of the above. <laughs> So you caught the fact that I didn't have friends for almost a year. You got that part right. <laughs> you caught it before I could tell you. And you know, I owe it to um, a really, really, I 
actually two very good friends of mine. I don't give, always give her the props she deserves. But there were two people who really played an, an instrumental role to me, coming out of my shell, coming into myself, and getting to know myself better. Because, again, as much as I was confident in who I believed I was at that time, at 17, 18 years old, the reality was there was still a lot more about myself that I was going to have to learn and would learn in the future. And so Zadie Dorn and Shaniqua Milligan, Zadie is, um, he uh, is from Chicago. In fact, his father is um, Bill Ayers, connected to Obama. Uh, yeah, connected to Obama. He's the coolest guy, by the way. Bill Ayers, he's just, he's the best, you know, what do you think? He's great. Um, and, you know, uh, Zay was this kid who was, it was clear that he was influenced, black, influenced by black culture. So I found it quite odd and interesting when, when it came down to us listening to similar types of music. And believe it or not, that's what joined us. Because, you know, oftentimes when you talk about um, diversity, we often discuss what separates us and what, what differentiates us as people. But, you know, people spend little time discussing what joins us and what brings us together. What is our common denominator? And music was my common denominator was they initially. And as I grew to know him more and more, Again, it's out of my comfort zone. As I grew to know him more and more, I realized that he was a cool person. And he, in turn, introduced me to people I never thought I'd talk to a day in my life. I had never seen a black person with pink hair. I had never talked to a, a politically conservative individual in my life. Of course, I hadn't really had political conversations, period, up to that point. You know, so it was just, it was, it was great. Zay was definitely one who really helped me out in that regard and showed me it was okay to reach out of my comfort zone. And then also, Shaniqua Milligan, she's, she was African American and she was, um, she uh, was a um, student in the prep for prep program throughout New York. And so she had benefited from studying with some of um, the top students in the country. And so she taught me about how to compete and how to basically navigate through uh, the difficulties that can come, the academic challenges that come, uh, uh, the feelings of inadequacy that can come when you are sitting in the classroom, for example, and you're the only black person in the classroom. Um, she really helped me to navigate through that, and those feelings of inadequacy. And she has been a wonderful friend to me over the years. Once I was able to really master that, and that coupled with some of the academic challenges that I faced, particularly with regards to writing, I thought that I was the best writer in the world because I was an A student in English at Baloo. But when I got to Brown, I realized that I was not Richard Wright. <laughs> um, and I had to bring it up a notch to meet the standard that was running across the curriculum. And I thought, well, I'm a mad person. And I don't have to do this writing stuff all the time. So I got to one of my math courses, and I had to write a paper for my math class. I thought, how absurd. <laughs> but that writing thing, I was not going to be able to get away from it. I was going to have to, to really rise to the occasion to be that challenge of becoming a better writer. And again, once I was able to engage the resources around me, the tutoring, 